Professor Skinner, we're here today to talk about verbal behavior, mm -hmm. the book by that name and the behavior of that name. Your book, Verbal Behavior, in which you set forth a behavioral account of language, strikes me as one of the great theoretical works of 20th century science, certainly the most important treatise on mind since the great British empirical philosophers, Locke and the rest, had their say on the topic. Do you object to my calling verbal behavior a treatise on mind and human understanding, terms borrowed from philosophy? I don't think so. It certainly is a book about how we talk about behavior and our own behavior. And the concept of mind could never have arisen until we reached the point at which we uh, talked about what we were doing. As I, I can't imagine that pre-verbal human organisms or any other species in the world ever ask itself, why did I do that? You, uh, you do things, and if successful, you do them again. <laughs> if not, you don't do them again, and so on. But under what conditions could you ever say to yourself, why did I do that? It's got to be verbal. You've got to start talking about yourself and others. Now, the first answer to that question, I think, must have come from noticing something inside your body as you were behaving. Oh, I must have done that because of the way I felt. I think it was only, uh, my guess is it would be when histories began to be written that you began to see sequences of events in which something else might explain the behavior, namely something that already happened. And that would explain the feelings that you have, what, what you're feeling in your body, and hence the behavior. But I think it's only it's only because we do talk about behavior that we understand what we call our mind. And that means that verbal behavior must have come before we had a mind, if there is such a thing, before we spoke about how we feel, why we did things, what, 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 our, what our states of mind were, what our thoughts were, and so on. Those are verbal constructs. Mm -hmm. But behavior is quite something else. It's what we do in the world as a result of genetic and personal history, what has happened to the species and what has happened to us as individuals. Well, near the end of verbal behavior, you have the statement, which I found startling the first dozen times I read it. Um, I'm paraphrasing, but it goes something like, thinking is behaving, as though they were really just two names for the same process. What yes. do you mean by that? Well, I, I am uh, what the philosophers would call a monist in the sense that I believe that I am nothing but a member of a particularly, uh, particular evolved species. And uh, nothing of any other kind uh, of thing exists in me. I've got to explain everything I do in terms of what will eventually come down to biochemical changes. And, uh, People in the nervous system will, will, will get onto those better. But up to beyond that, I can only suppose that I do things in the sense of acting upon the world, and only when that world has certain features at a given time because of what has happened to me. Now, if I see you, then I just, I'm just seeing you but not doing anything more. I just stop talking for a bit, and I'll just sit there seeing you. Well, what is that except what is happening in my head when you are stimulating my eyes in a particular way? Now, if I were studying you as a pure sensation, a spot of red or something like that, I would probably trace it to genetics. What is going on in the, in the eye that leads me to see red? But since you are very much more than that, I would have to explain what I now see in terms of what has happened to me in the past many hundreds of times as I've talked with you. That is the difference between perception and, and the sensation. But it's all still what I am doing because of my genetic endowment, my eyes, and my nerve systems, and so on, and my past history. Now, I can close my eyes and I'm still seeing you. 
I'm not doing it very well. I do it much better with my eyes open, but I still do it. And what I am doing is what I am doing with my eyes open. It's the same activity in my nervous system. I have no inclination about that. In a long time in the future, uh, the physiologist will have a very clear picture of what it is. But it is something that I do, and I've, I've done it because it was very important for uh, a member of a species in the past to see things and get out of the way or eat them up, whatever whatever the case was. And therefore, for, for individuals uh, to do the same things, thanks to a different process of selection, namely operant conditioning. Uh, it's part of my activity, and in a very broader sense, that is what behaving is, doing what I am doing. Well, um, a common view in psychology, not, not our view, I think, mm -hmm. is that uh, the true subject matter of psychology is some inner process of thought that lies behind yes. behavior. And behavior mm -hmm. is often mm -hmm. thought of as um, a mere symptom, almost a trivial byproduct of yes. this inner yes. thinking process. Yes. What, do you, what do you make then of that inner outer distinction? Well, I think the reason that we now question the inner thing, the reason there's been a behavioristic revolution, is that we now know more about the behavior. Up until 1913, at least, no one seriously said that you can forget about these internal things and look at the behavior. But that was only possible because people had begun to study behavior. Now, behaviorism didn't amount to much for 25 years because we didn't know much about it, about what people do. Rats ran through mazes and uh, dogs salivated the bells and whatnot. But that was, there was no real science of the behavioral antecedents of behavior, of the, the environmental antecedents of behavior. Once they had been discovered and very carefully worked out, there was something else to explain what we do in addition to what we're feeling. And then you realize that once you have a science of behavior which establishes the role of the environment, two, two sciences really, ethology, the role of natural selection, and experimental analysis of behavior as the role of the environment of the individual through often conditioning, once you have that science, then there's less need to look inside for a cause, and eventually you can simply say there's no need at all, because what is inside is a product of the history. So that what happens is, as I grew up as a, as a baby and a child and an adult, was that my body was slowly changed by contingency to reinforcement. It remained a, a body produced by natural selection. And that as soon as we understand the environmental sources of what I do all the way along, we don't need to bother about how it, how it feels when I'm doing it. But what, is, what philosophers have done for two and a half thousand years at least is to try to look more and more, more and more closely at what they feel or what they see introspectively. And of course, they never have got anywhere. And they, they, Plato was still taught today in departments of philosophy, you see, 2,500 years later. And moreover, the, uh, the cognitive psychology has given up on introspection. The psychology in general has. Do you, do you find a psychologist sitting around observing mental life anymore? No. The cognitive processes are inferences which you establish by hypotheses and, uh, and inferences and so on. No, I don't know of a single psychologist who sits around and watches a stream of consciousness or is a trained observer in the Wundtian tradition. So the behavioristic att attack on introspection has been totally successful. Introspection is now out as a process of science. It's still there with philosophy, and they can have it. And uh, they will, uh, but the good philosophers, uh, uh, I would say someone like Bertrand Russell, I think, realizes that you can't get much out of introspection, although it's interesting to look at yourself when you're thinking, but you've got eventually to get back to a physical explanation. You say look at yourself when you're thinking. I mean, you, I think, of all people in psychology have been uh, a paragon 
of what can be accomplished, what one can accomplish with themselves when they look at themselves. I mean, you, you are always, it seems to me, analyzing your own behavior and trying to uh, plan your environment to get maximum production and, and enjoyment out of your well, life. Well, yes, because it's not that I want to find out how to think better. I find out under what conditions do I think better. And that's very different. I, what is left to me at 84 is very little, uh, except to go on with what I've done. Uh, I, the, the, the thing I enjoy most is thinking. When I'm at my desk, when I've not eaten too much or too tired talking to people and so on, at my desk, I, that is, I'm, I'm, I'm never, never happier. Uh, it is just a wonderful state to be in, especially when the sentences do come out and so on and so on. Now, I don't do that by screwing up my cherry to the sticking place and think. I arrange my personal history for the preceding 24 hours to get that state. And of course, I have to look at the state. I watch myself. I see myself saying things. This is uh, what I learned to do as a member of a species which specializes in self-observation. And I don't question the importance of this. I would advise therapists to be behavior therapists, not psychotherapists, to change the world that pe in which people live, not their minds or their feelings. But I would say, for heaven's sake, ask people how they feel. Ask people what they're going to do or what they, uh, their intentions are. That's the best way you can get information about their history. But you're not getting at the initial cause. And I am not changing the initial causes in my behavior. I'm changing the external causes, mm -hmm. which cause me to be in a state when I am most productive as a thinker. Well, okay, okay. what do you mean then by thinking? Let's come back to that question when, of thinking and behaving. What is the kind of thing? What do you mean by the thinking that you do? Well, there's a whole difference between the cognitive idea that I'm, when I'm there, I'm retrieving something, retrieving thoughts, like remembering a name. Do you retrieve a name from memory? I don't think so at all. When you go through the alphabet to prompt yourself, you work to get the name to come, but you don't go like, in a filing cabinet and pull it out uh, or go dial a computer and have it appear on the screen. You don't retrieve. The whole idea that of retrieving information that the cognitive psychologist talks about is ridiculous. We don't retrieve. We, we try to create conditions in which something happens. And when I'm writing a paper, I have an outline, a topic, and I have a lot of other things all arranged in a useful file and so on. I do everything I can to get that next sentence out. But I don't compose it. I don't search for it. I don't re retrieve it from some mess of memories or anything like that. Then, then do you not, are you not responsible for your own thinking? No, of course not. No, well, we're not responsible for anything we do, except in the ethical sense that we, we have been taught by our culture to take steps so that we don't do certain kinds of things. And if we haven't taken those steps, we are held responsible. I would hold them responsible. We're not teaching us to take them, but that's another matter. Uh, in the long run, uh, I think behavior is simply what various complicated biochemical systems do under certain circumstances. And, um, I don't think uh, a biochemical system acts in order to achieve a goal. <laughs> it acts in certain ways and with a given result. Well, that brings me to another question I, <laughs> I wanted well. to ask you about. Uh, about midway through verbal behavior, there is a statement uh, that, for me, has always summed up one of the book's chief lessons. I'm paraphrasing again, but it, but it roughly goes, the speaker is a locus where variables come together to produce their effect. Mm -hmm. I don't think anybody...